priced at. Um, uh, we're going into our ninth or tenth season uh, growing diversified vegetables here in Moscow. Um, you guys probably all heard um, what I had to say and introduced the farm last time, um, but uh, uh, we're a small farm, a little over half acre now, um, and we grow on multiple sites and um, everything is direct marketed. Um, so um, enterprise budgets uh, um, have really, really kind of helped us uh, drill down and, and fine tune what we're doing on our farm um, and try to make things as profitable as they can since we all know that um, uh, agriculture is uh, not always one of the most profitable things depending on what you're growing. So um, this is uh, something that I've spent a lot of time doing in the winters. Um, just not having time in the season, but um, it's it's helped inform decisions um, uh, and where we want to go. Um, so uh, here's a picture of our home base. Uh, we have two other sites in town, um, and we have uh, four four hoop houses. Uh, one of them that is uh, routinely heated for uh, starts and an early season, um, and uh, we're butting up to a creek and a, a city park and so we have a lot of open space around us which is nice um, uh, and, and benefits us in a variety of ways but um, so how do you how do you start to decide what you want to do and and this question is probably going to come up before you really um, do a lot of work in enterprise budgets but um, because most people get into farming because they, they want to either have animals or, or grow certain things. Um, and so you, fo you follow your passion from the beginning, but uh, it's smart to keep this in your mind and it's, at some point um, start to really get into some of the numbers of, of what's happening. Um, and we did this probably, you know, started doing enterprise budgets maybe year three or so of, of farming. Um, and they started out simple and just got more and more detailed. And I'll go through that as we, as we get further into this. Um, so we kind of started out with the, the four, top four bullet points um, of choosing what, what it is we were going to be doing. Um, and I'd really highlight, uh, you know, what you think your market will, um, will hold or what people will buy. Um, and so, so we've, every year we're, we're fine tuning um, based on that. And to do that takes, you know, gathering some data and, and looking at it. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about a variety of ways that we do that. But um, also with our short seasons here, you know, growing varieties and crops that, that are well suited for that is, is pretty important for us. Um, and I'd say for most people, um, you can push the limits to a certain degree, but, um, that probably will will have a, an effect on the bottom line. Um, and then, you know, as we as we did this for a few more years, then then looking at the time involved for each thing, um, and and what actually pencils out. Um, and so that's what we're really going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about today, um, because because every crop is a little different. And we always kind of started every year with um, with kind of this equation and starting with the profit of, of okay, if we have this much time, what, what is it that we want to be doing and how much money do we want to, how much money do we need to bring in to keep the operation running? Um, because if this is what we want to do, then we need to, we need to actually have it pay the bills and pay ourselves. Um, so starting out with that and working backwards then um, to see what it takes to grow and at what price points um, and and then fine-tuning expenses to get to that uh, that net profit that, that you feel like you need or want um, <clears throat> and you know I mean you can separate we're separating out all these crops um, but but kind of an example of maybe going too far would be if you were to separate all these different colored carrots out into individual enterprises. You surely could do it, um, but uh, 
based on what we've done in these specific varieties, these all had similar maturity dates, similar growth habits. And so we all lumped them. They were just carrots. Um, now there could be a difference between bunched carrots and um, bulk carrots or baby carrots, and you could run different numbers for each of those. And that could be very worthwhile. Um, but you also need to be mindful how much time you spend doing this um, because you're, you're, um, uh, you're, you're not producing a product by, by doing it. You're, you're analyzing your numbers um, to make decisions. So um, there can be a little bit of black hole in, in working on enterprise budget. So just be mindful of that. Um, so uh, to work on our profits, you know, we're always trying to be as efficient as we can um, and, and trying to keep the records that make sense to keep um, to do that. Um, and we'll talk about outlining our costs and, and what all the labor, uh, is involved for certain things. Um, but those are numbers that are going to, um, uh, give us a, a price point for each crop. And then something that really helped us, um, uh, compare different crops is to try and have a standard size of space. So we grow everything on a 50 foot bed and that's our measure of, um, of a, a bed length um, that, that we can easily save. What's 50 feet of cucumbers compared to 50 feet of lettuce? Um, so that really helps. Um, and the goal of all this is finding a true cost of your product. So you can value your time, so you can talk in a educated way about what it is that you need to, to charge um, and really including overhead, um, the, the farm overhead in this um, is important because that's needed to keep everything going. So here I'm going to show a number of spreadsheets um, and uh, a lot of these are taken but modified from uh, Richard Wiswall's the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. Um, and it's a great book, a lot of info. Um, he's a lot larger farm than we are, but um, he's done a lot of work in, in making his farm profitable and sharing that information. And so actually the, the book comes with a CD with a, a lot of these spreadsheets. And um, I've just tuned them to work for us. And so they're a little different. Um, but I just want to uh, run through a few things, then we're going to compare how our overhead has changed through the years a little bit. Um, and so a few of the bulleted points, um, you know, the, the farm pays a chunk of our mortgage, our taxes, our utilities. So that's all this stuff. These are all our fixed cost. Doesn't matter what we grow or how much of it. These are what we're going to be um, paying out no matter what the, the production size. Um, and then I want to point your attention to uh, the three labor categories at the bottom of that first section. Um, and, and these are, uh, for me as a manager, um, time spent weekly or monthly to, uh, you know, manage the office duties, manage uh, a team. And, and it's amazing how much time you can spend, you know, organizing work for a crew of people for, um, for each day or, or each week. Um, and so that's another thing that can kind of get lost in the whole thing. But um, we went through a number of years just trying to track everything. And, and so we have a lot of this information. Um, but now we try to pick a few things every year to track on, and that just helps us keep fine tuning everything. So all those added up, um, then, sorry about that, there we go. All those added up um, make for an overhead, a total overhead of almost 15,000. That's what it takes for us to keep our operation going. Um, that doesn't include buying seeds. It doesn't include um, all the supplies. Um, so then we allocate depending on um, how, and this is just personal preference, but we allocate a certain amount of that overhead to our greenhouses because we expect more out of those spaces. Um, and uh, um, basically we're allocating a certain dollar amount per bed. So that's where you see that $333 per hoop house bed. Um, and uh, we allocate a smaller amount than if you go down below that, um, depending on how many 
outdoor field beds we have. Uh, and in 2015, we had 192 of them. So then we were allocating $46 to each bed, um, each 50 foot bed. And so, so that helps us then do that comparison of, of each bed and each crop. Um, we went through a, a little downsizing then um, in 2017. So I included uh, a few years later and show the main thing to, to look at here is our overhead or total overhead reduced um, because of uh, fewer sites um, uh, and a few other, a lot of changes in the management um, and the time taken on my part uh, for that. Um, but also leases, uh, land leases reduced. Um, so we have a lower overhead. We're allocating on um, 50 beds rather than 150, 192 beds. And that then increased our bed, um, our outdoor bed allocation to 117. So um, you can see that's where scale comes in. And um, you know the old adage of get bigger, get out. Uh, is true to a certain point, but we always like to say you, you've got to know your numbers, and and I think it's really evident that small scale ag is is challenging that thought. Um, but with that said, um, there is a size that makes sense, um, and and there's a size that's too small to to really make these numbers work for you. Um, then fast forward to 2020, I don't have a spreadsheet of this, but 2020, we've uh, bumped our beds back up to maybe the 75 um, mark. And um, so our, our overhead allocation per 50 foot bed is more around, um, more around $80 per bed now. So the record keeping to make this all happen for overhead, that's pretty easy. You've got your billing statements. You can look at that and plug all that stuff in and track it. Um, the harder thing to track is your time on each crop. Um, and and <laughs> you'd think it'd be easy to click you know, an app on your phone and say, start time, I'm weeding the radishes, now I'm done. Uh, but it, it really, it gets, complicated and you're doing so many tasks in a day that um, that you really want to try and focus on a few things to start out with. Um, so profitability, it's all going to be farm specific. We're all doing things differently. Um, and so your records are really your own records and are not really transferable to a lot of other operations. You know, there might be some similarities, but um, that's why it's important to track some of this stuff. And um, so we're we're tracking you know yields in that 50 foot bed or whatever unit of space you have, um, and and we're tracking all time to maintain it, harvest it, and sell it. Um, and then we're we're really focusing every year. We focus on the volume we take to a market, the volume we take back. That helps you fine tune production so you're not overproducing, or if you're underproducing, you can you can try and meet more demand. Um, so that's one that we do every year. Um, and just a few slides on what we feel like these enterprise budgets have helped us on. Um, you know, we've talked about comparing different incomes, but we've used it to analyze value added stuff, which we did for a time and now we're not. Um, we're doing a flower CSA this year uh, and, and we're excited about that. Um, uh, but it, I think it's really going to help our bottom line, and so we've done some some work on that. Um, and then spring starts is a big part of our business, and um, and we found that that's fairly lucrative where we are, and so we we're continually kind of expanding that. Um, and we've compared where we grow these starts in a in a variety of ways, um, but we we grow at a few different places um, early in the year and we rent some heated space and they're on the left and um, it's been really interesting to compare those costs um, so that renting cost versus us heating our own hoop house um, uh, pros and cons of both but uh, you know we have more cost and we can allocate and say each start um, that we produce in our heated space costs us more 
um, than it does to do it at at a, a rented space. Um, now that might be different, just depends on what the rate is and what you're using the heat with. Um, uh, and that's changed over the years for us at our own place. You know, we used to heat with wood, we're doing pellets now, um, and propane would be different. So, uh, so just looking at all of that and, um, uh, you know, we do both still. Um, for a variety of reasons, but uh, it's good to know, you know, that there is a difference between them. It's helped us uh, make decisions on, you know, how many CSAs we should do, um, what varieties of cucumbers we should do, but it doesn't always just come down to the numbers, right? I mean, we're doing this because we love it, and so what to, what cucumbers taste the best? Um, that's That's maybe going to drive a decision more than the numbers. And uh, so really we're just trying to place value on our time and, uh, and the space that we, we manage um, and trying to make a decision, you know, a fast decision on a harvest day of, well, is that cilantro worth cutting or are we just trying to milk it for a little bit more and it's not gonna be worth it. Um, you'll, you'll just, that'll come you know, over time, but it's, uh, it's kind of helped us have the numbers behind that to enforce that, that decision. Um, so pinpointing costs, we talked about that. You want to be able to know what things are, are taking to, to make. Um, so then this is the, the bottom half of a, um, enterprise budget, uh, that I'll show you a full slide of in a bit, but, um, but this is, this is what I'm talking about when we're, we're getting down to the cost per unit. Um, and this is for winter squash. Um, you know, we have sold wholesale over the years, um, and we're not doing any of that now because of our size. Uh, but when we were, um, it was really important for us to do this because you talk price and you're, you're being compared against larger growers uh, getting into a grocery store or wherever it may be um, that the wholesale uh, market kind of exposes you to. Um, we were always really conscious that we never wanted to dump uh, produce um, at below cost or undercut somebody else. You know, it's really, there can be uh, stiff competition in different markets and um, uh, racing to the bottom for, for prices uh, is really always a, a negative, there's a negative cloud that goes with it and it doesn't, doesn't really help anybody. Um, so, so we always valued this for that reason as well. Um, so we could value our time. Uh, looking at this spreadsheet, then um, you start at the top in that $131. Um, that incorporates all the money um, taken to grow one bed um, of winter squash. So the seeds, the time to plant them, transplant weed, um, and then it includes that overhead, which now is about $80 a bed. Um, <clears throat> so that cost is put in. And then we've got a couple different price points below that for sales. Um, and uh, this is not super current. Um, we're selling our, our winter squash for $1.75 a pound now. Um, so the numbers here would be modify a little bit, but um, uh, then based on what your yield um, data shows you, then you can, you can kind of drill down. We've decided, okay, 150 pounds for that 50 foot bed is, is reasonable. Um, what are we making off that bed? You know, minus the cost, $93 is what we're making. Um, we, I like to just have an extrapolation out to an acre. Um, and, um, you know, we've never grown an acre of one crop, but that's kind of a, a, a benchmark. And then, uh, getting down to here, 88 cents is what it cost, uh, us a couple years ago to produce that pound of squash. Um, so we're making 62 cents um, per pound. And um, that's where, you know, you can say, okay, I need a dollar a pound minimum to, to make this work and make a little bit of a profit or whatever it may be, um, depending on the crop. 
And, and really then, you know, the, the hidden bit of this that can help is, you know, if the numbers don't seem to be working on paper, why is it? And looking back, you know, oh, well, we spent, you know, double the time weeding these onions than we should have. And it was because we, we did it too late and those weeds are too big. Um, you know, if we would have passed with hose um, and scratched the surface a, a few weeks earlier, then, then we would have reduced the time a lot. So it can help you modify your production methods um, that will help that bottom line. Um, and you may be able to see that without doing these spreadsheets, but, but there have been instances, um, like this one's easy to point out, right? Um, I don't need a spreadsheet to tell me we should have weeded that earlier, but um, there are other things that, that it has helped with that. Um, we used to grow a lot of brassicas um, and kind of similar thing here, they're space hogs. When we downsized, we just couldn't fit them in, um, but it reinforced our decision knowing, okay, we're not making as much as we are when we're going salad mix or, you know, a, a variety of other crops. So we grow a little bit of this stuff still, um, but, but nowhere near as much as we used to. And here's an example of a real simple uh, budget. This is kind of what we started at um, a few years into growing. And um, all these numbers on here are just hours. Um, uh, the first column is large heads, second column is small heads. We charge different amount for each two versus three dollars. And um, so this is just tallying everything going into the crop. Um, I'll point out like, come up with a base hourly wage that you can just apply to all this. Um, and years ago we were just saying okay eight dollars an hour is what we what our minimum pay would be for anybody that way we can feel good that if we get sick or can't work somebody else can fill in and the numbers stay the same you know we can af afford to pay somebody to do the job um and you can set that at whatever you want you can change it through the years um but just going down you know we've got our yields we can harvest more um, baby heads out of a, a bed than we can large heads. So you see that, see that in the yields and that then translates into a little more profitability growing small heads than large heads. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty simple one. I would say start simple because you go to the next thing. These are, are modified again from that, that um, Richard Wiswall's uh, business handbook and uh, we've got a lot more detail here uh, so we're separating things into three columns labor machinery which is limited because uh, we do a lot by hand and then product so that'd be this the, the starts themselves a compost um, you know if you're using fabric or what irrigation and so all of these, instead of a um, hour allocation, these are all based on that $8 an hour. But um, if you see like in the first arrow, transplanting labor, it says four uh, under labor, um, that is $4. So we've got a half hour in transplanting a bed of, of this crop. Um, so all those costs then can get added up. Um, we've got our, our potential yield, um, the time it takes for that. Then the second arrow is, is, is the harvest, the, the washing and the packing, and maybe a little bit of delivery depending on what you're doing. Um, and then uh, going down, we have a category for marketing. Uh, and so just like we allocate, you know, a certain amount of overhead to each bed, we want to allocate uh, what it takes for one or two people to run market, the fee that it takes to go to market, all of the costs for the gear uh, needed for it, and we're distributing those over however many crops we grow. Um, and so, uh, so that gets added in for each thing. Um, and we come up with a complete crop cost that that includes that marketing of almost $80 um, there on the far right. And um, so we add that to our overhead per bed um, and that's where we get that crop and overhead total. 
um, that we can deduct off of off of our our gross. Um, Again, this is just dealing with a 50 foot bed. Um, we've got a couple different price points. This is all large heads. Um, and, and then the same, the same material at the bottom that we talked about with winter squash. Um, but we know, okay, we're producing a head of lettuce for less than a dollar a head. We're selling it for three. That's a really great rate. We're happy with it. These numbers modified a little bit from the simple uh, budget that I showed, but um, uh, that's just because over the years we've gotten more detailed. We have more records to kind of average. So we probably got four or five years of tracking head lettuce and we can average all those and we get a pretty good um, idea of what it takes to grow something, even considering that there might be, you know, a really bad weed year or a really something that affects um, yield uh, or the time we put into something. And it's good to include that stuff because it's always going to be, there's always going to be something that doesn't go completely to plan. Um, here's the same thing with the small heads. Um, so again, at the bottom, we're, we're just showing that it, um, we're making a little bit more per bed. Um, even though it costs a little bit more to produce that. Um, and, and the reason there is we've got more seedlings per bed. The transplant time is more and it takes a little bit longer to weed because you got to work a, a, a hoe or a tool around more, more individual plants. Um, so everything takes a little bit more, but you make a little bit more um, on, this, on this scenario. And this is just kind of, we used to do a lot of laying hens um, and we always felt like uh, uh, we started out with two and somehow ended up with a hundred at some point. And um, we, we did it for a number of years. We enjoyed it, but we were kind of happy to let it go after a while. Uh, and, and we always ran a lot of numbers on this stuff. We, um, we based the decision off of the numbers and the, you know, desire to keep keeping chickens. Um, uh, but scale was really important when we were doing birds. Um, and we, we found even with getting really affordable feed um, and free ranging them that, that we were um, not able to really feel like it was profitable unless we had close to 50 birds. Um, and that's going to be different for everybody. Um, but uh, between that and juggling vegetables and animals and possible cross-contamination things, we decided to um, stop doing birds a few years ago. And um, uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime, but um, but we kind of have the, the numbers to say, well, we should have 100 birds minimum or whatever it may be. And I'll just kind of leave you guys with this that, um, uh, you know, it's, th this stuff takes a bit of work to, to work through and, but it's well worth it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, you can have a bunch of irrigation leaks and, and they're easy to spot. Um, and you're going to be, you know, spending more money if you're pumping extra water out, that's not needed. Um, but it's a pretty easy thing to see and, and then address and fix. And uh, whereas, whereas, you know, leaky holes that, that are in, you know, some sort of production of a, a individual crop, um, you know, or, or maybe just your style of growing that crop or where your climate is and, and how it, how the crop responds to that just may not be conducive for your farm. So, so kind of tracking this stuff, um, comparing and, and really kind of knowing your production costs and, and what you want to get out of it, um, has a, has a big benefit. There's a, there's a workload that goes with it, but it has, has a real benefit to it. Um, so with that, I will turn this back over and if we're going to have questions. Yeah, so we probably will have some questions. I'm going to encourage each site to pass their questions up to their site facilitator to get those in the Q&A box. And while folks are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and share um, 
the screen with Ken and he can do a brief uh, kind of overview about enterprise budgets. So thanks for being patient with us as we work through the technology. Ken, if you can go ahead and share your screen and then Greg, if you wouldn't mind hanging on for that Q&A period, that'll be after Ken's presentation. Sure. Thank you. Okay, Ken, I'm going to unmute you and let you share your screen. There's always a little bit of technology that we, we deal with when we go back and forth to different sites, but it's well worth it to get perspectives and um, expertise from around our state. So Ken, I do see your PowerPoint slide. I see your introduction and I'm going to go ahead and turn the sound over to you. I think I need to unmute. Uh, nope, I can hear you. Oh boy, I'm like exceeding my own expectations. Excellent. How's the sound? <laughs> The sound is good. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I just really enjoy Greg's presentation because it's just like you're sitting at his desk with him and he's giving you what he does on a, maybe not a daily basis, but frequently you can tell he really enjoys the book work. Not many people do. It's a habit sometimes you have to really work to, uh, to develop. I just wanted to, I just put this slide up to remind everybody this is what we're doing, the whole farm planning, we're building this plan and the enterprise budgets. I, I'm going to give you, um, Greg gave you his desktop view. I'm going to give a like two miles in the high in the sky point of view. Enterprise budgets are really the basis for our whole farm plan because they're like the building blocks of the foundation. They're they're part of other budgets we do in the whole farm plan. Um, the whole farm budget, cash flow budgets, and partial budgets are really important budgets. Um, and you could see those forming out of Greg's, out of Greg's enterprise budgets if you think about it. Um, for instance, cash flow budget would itemize income and expenses throughout the year, either monthly or quarterly. And you could see in Greg's uh, example how those expenses that he added up and put in a single budget are spread throughout the year, seed at one time. Um, enterprise budget. The enterprise budget to remember is they're based, like Greg mentioned, on per acre, per bed, per animal, um, per animal unit in case of maybe a cow calf or a, um, a, another type of livestock budget. So a per unit, and then you can take that unit for planning purposes and either a whole farm or a cash flow budget, you take that unit and just replicate it across your budget based on your projected number of units that you're going to grow or uh, raise in livestock. So it, it, it's a great, great planning tool. Um, it, it really is the, the foundation of those budgets I mentioned, including partial budget, which is um, partial budgets, otherwise known as like T budgets. And um, they're a great tool just to evaluate a little change you might want to um, make in your operation. I've heard enterprise budgets called cost centers. I've heard them called like gross margin analysis. Um, so different words, but real for a really, um, really important um, concept. Uh, Greg mentioned using enterprise budgets to basically they out also outline our production practices. So in order to put together an enterprise budget, so his for his lettuce example, he, he remember he how he had all the different operations for labor and then he used those operations, he assigned a value to them in order to come up with a price for labor for that enterprise. Well, th those kinds of uh, details will inform the decisions we make on the farm because that labor budget is spread throughout the year and is one of those characteristics of a of an enterprise that can limit because we only have so much labor, we only have so much time. So those kinds of things also with inputs or 
machinery you might be using uh, or land. Those kind of inputs are all in that enterprise budget. And then let's say you build an enterprise budget for lettuce. You have only a certain number of beds and you have other crops you're going to grow too. So you, that, gives you that, that gives you the information to build these other budgets, which are part of the whole farm business plan and which is part of the whole farm um, uh, picture. We can also use these enterprise budgets to build um, uh, applications for financing. You, you can use them if you're considering uh, building up a, a new enterprise. Uh, then you have to depend on somebody else's numbers. You borrow their numbers, put them in your enterprise budget, and then compare it to your current enterprises and see if you want to consider that new enterprise uh, in your operation. So there's some, some great benefits for that. I just want to make a couple of cautions. I, I really want to keep this brief and just add on to what Greg said, but a couple of cautions. You remember how Greg really emphasized data the data collection and data comes from record keeping and rep record keeping comes from diligence. And that's something that we're not all really good at, but we can all improve. And the, the better your data is, it's garbage in, garbage out. The better your dab, data is, the better your, dis, your enterprise budgets will be and the better your decisions will be, more informed they will be. Also, another caution is to, it, is to standardize. Greg kind of showed that he started out with a more simple budget and then he got a little more complex. That's great, but you should also keep in mind that if you're going to compare between enterprises, you want to use the standardized um, version of an enterprise budget. So you're comparing to apples to oranges, not comparing apples to oranges, you're comparing apples to apples. Um, so those are just some things to remember. Oh, I just want to mention one last thing, and that was that Greg had did a great job of making sure his time and his partner's time was accounted for in their budgets, their labor time. Sometimes another thing that's not accounted for is like all the time Greg puts in on putting these budgets together, the management time. That's a really hard hard to get a thing to get a number for because for labor you can use like he used eight dollars the kind of the basic labor source price he could get, that he used to estimate labor it's hard to get this it's it's more difficult to get this for profit and management so sometimes we use an opportunity cost and briefly that's just if I wasn't doing this what could I be doing and what could I be making at that? And you can use that to estimate um, a, a return to management, a return to uh, that kind of work. And that kind of work deserves a return, ought to be included, particularly if you're putting together a budget that you're making decisions either on expansion or um, cutting back or changing enterprises. So I think we can, I'll share my screen back and we can go to question time. All right, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So Greg, we do have a couple questions for you and thanks Ken for that overall um, overview of enterprise budgets. And just for those of you who um, may have questions about a number of those uh, financial documents that Ken was talking about at the end of today's workshop, I'll talk to you about a webinar series that's really going to um, provide you some more information and it's a free series about um, financial fitness for farmers and what some of those key uh, financial documents are. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into some questions that we have for Greg. One is, Greg, how do you track labor and do you use any type of online record keeping or apps like to do any of your record keeping? Um, if, I, if I remember the name right, we, we tried um, Wonderlist. Um, and I'm not sure if that's exactly uh, specifically for, say, tracking time. But um, uh, I, I think we, we, 
we dabbled in it a bit. Um, but as you can see, it didn't stick and we're, we're not using anything like that anymore. Um, uh, I have a, a crazy long list of notes in my phone and then I'm always using the, the stopwatch um, for things. Uh, and so, you know, you do that. There are definitely times when you forget to hit the stopwatch. And, uh, so it makes sense to then, um, this picture here is our wash shed and in our wash shed, we have a big whiteboard that, um, you know, we have one whiteboard that's daily tasks, um, or harvest lists. And then we have another one that's specifically for, um, writing down, uh, time trial, basically stuff. Um, and so we're in this shed multiple times a day or in between each harvesting of each crop. Um, and, you know, if we've forgotten to hit that stopwatch, then, you know, it's, it's on me, but I'm, I'm trying to kind of get, get my, um, the people that help me to, to do this as well as, is, you know, come in and even if it's a estimation of what what that time is that it took to harvest you know two boxes of beets you know write it down on there um and and the best is yeah if we've hit and hit the stopwatch and we can we can have a real specific number and that's why um that's why for us like we will identify maybe five crops total every year that we're going to really specifically track and and that that is my that is my duty um, to to do that, uh, and and so it can even be different from like we may just track our early beets versus our mid or late season beets because um, they're all going to be growing at different rates. Um, but yeah, it's it's a tricky thing to do. Um, we're still doing it longhand um, and just tracking time for it. Great, thank you. Um, Another question we has is what is, do you have a standard bed width and how do you t determine what that is? Yeah, our standard bed is, um, is a three, three foot top. Um, well, probably a little less than that, 20, 24, 26 inch um, bed top, but then it slopes down. So basically we have three foot beds, one foot paths. Um, uh, and we like that being standard throughout the farm um, because then we can switch an irrigation header anywhere if need be. Um, generally those stay in place, but um, for a variety of things, hoops, row cover and irrigation, um, it's nice to have that be standard. Um, the other reason for that, and this is, it's a very standard width of bed um, that's used in the industry. It doesn't, uh, it minimizes the amount of uh, back strain. If you're in a path, you can very easily reach the center of the bed um, from either side. Um, you can reach the far side of the bed as well, um, but it's, uh, it's a little bit of a strain, but not, not too much. Um, we're not doing anything with tractors. Um, if we were, we'd have a wider, a wider spacing more than likely. Um, so. Great. Thank you. And our last question is, um, in terms of your personal use of your crops, so your personal consumption of things from your farm, do you have an accounting of what that use is? So do you buy your own crops for personal use or is there any way that you track that and what would you recommend? Uh, yeah, no, that's the black hole. <laughs> um, no, I don't like to, I don't like to track all of that. Um, I would say, I mean, we, we allocate uh, generally for like storage crops that we're putting in. Um, we'll put in a bed for ourselves or a half bed or, or what, what have you. And I will separate that out. But, um, you know, the head of lettuce that we eat every week, um, that's just a perk of, of running the farm for us. Um, and, and the numbers that we have in the spreadsheet still, um, still help us make those decisions because, you know, it's, it's the money going in and the money coming out. It's, it's only that, that we're personally benefiting from that. And, um, and we just view that as as one of the things that we we get as as farm owners. Um, the other black hole in it, um, and 
well, I would, I would say it's not a black hole, um, but growing anything, you're going to have a certain amount of culls. And so um, those, those we additionally track um, in, in our um, time trials. And, uh, and then again, if we have multiple years or beds of data on something, we then average that.